All right, folks, welcome. Welcome to my talk about building a resilient, secure, and maintainable API platform. Thank you for joining us. So Wiseman told me to start with your first slide with your key message. So the key message of today is to tell you that security and resilience actually go together like horse and carriage. So whom of you know who I paraphrase here? Hands? OK, so this is about Frank Sinatra, horse and marriage. Right, so who am I? First and foremost, I'm a proud father. Then second, I'm a functional programming evangelist at ING. I also teach functional and reactive programming there. And then I'm the Global API SDK lead engineer at the Global API platform at ING. You can contact me through the links at this uh, presentation. Pre include a photo of myself, not of my daughter, because I didn't want to go through the GDPR hassles of including a photo of her. Um, but we will see her later in the slides. So credits go out to all my team members and everyone else at the API platform for building the API platform. Could not have done that myself, of course. So uh, thank you, guys. Uh, and all the MA pictures in this talk have been drawn by a Beril colleague, and she made them uh, look very nice. So thank you to you. Right, so a bit of introduction. The context of this talk is that ING is actually pretty uh, large. It's a big bank. Uh, present in over 25 countries, running over 300 development teams, and we have many, many different products across many different uh, legal regions, and we also have a ton of history uh, across for all of these products. So you can imagine that this leads to a very heterogeneous landscape, and what we want to achieve is to have a more homogeneous landscape and morph everything into running on one global API platform, or ex actually one global platform. And we started this initiative in 2016, so that's about running for three years now. Bit on the technical context, we want to achieve zero trust networking. So the basis of everything we're doing is that we can't trust the network. This has been first coined by Google. And uh, we, in fact, have a pretty good IT infrastructure, which means that the network is actually quite OK. And if things go wrong, they go terribly wrong. So this is kind of easy to detect, as opposed to some intermittent failures that you might ex experience at uh, various on cl cloud providers. Then we have or expect that we will have 50 million active customers uh, after the year 2020. And we need to deal with that. So we need to be able to scale. And actually, most workloads in our system are network IO bound or latency bound. The other thing that we want to do is we want to have everyone to have one way of working so that we can uh, basically, when you build an application in one team, you can just go to another team, start building on working on that application, and basically everything should be familiar to you. Then the goal of my team, we're developing the SDK that we'll see later. And our goal specifically is to enable teams to deliver their business values uh, using APIs and do that in a secure, resilient, and uh, manner and with minimal effort. So for this talk, we'll discuss some terminology, which is, might be a bit different than you're used to. We'll discuss the architecture, then some, Im some implementation, and we'll conclude. We'll explicitly not talk about naming conventions, whether you use, should use singular or plural names uh, when designing your APIs, for example, how to execute security scans, or how to do release strategies. There are whole, are whole dedicated talks on those subjects. All right, terminology. The word API, we, this is we, um, what I'm going to describe is the meta model that we use when describing APIs. And the word the API is used as follows, is in that it's a specification of a set of endpoints. Normally, API can mean anything like an interface you program to, or even a, sometimes it's used as the, um, the running thing to refer to the running thing. In our case, in this talk, when I refer to API, I actually mean just the set of specifications of these endpoints. They are described in Swagger or OpenAPI version 2. And an endpoint, in our case, is a triplet. And it consists of the host, a logical host, like api.ing.com. You can compare this to a group ID in Maven. The methods, get, boot, post, patch, etc., and a path template. Why do I say path template? I say path template bec because it contains a path variable. This triplet of three things 
is it the unique identifier of our endpoints, we me which means that these will be the things we use to identify an endpoint identifier. Then we have services. And services are named logical components owned by teams, and they can consist of multiple versions. Or they consist of multiple versions. A version of a service actually is the thing that's implementing a specific set of endpoints, and uh, these endpoints can come from one or more and, uh, API specifications. Then we have an instance, which is actually the running code or process that's actually implementing a specific service version. There's more on this by my colleague uh, Patrice on API in the talk API versioning for zero downtime. He's going into this quite deeply. So uh, for more information on this, please visit this talk. So now on the architecture of this, uh, of our platform. One of the founding principles of this platform is that we want to achieve a single customer identity or a single way of representing a customer identity. Remember that we had 25 different countries. Each of these countries had a different way of identifying a customer in code or in payload in headers. We also want to achieve that we have applications running in one global addressable and routable namespace so that in theory everything can talk to each other. Um, uh, maybe there can be firewalls in between, of course, but everything should be able to talk to each other. Then we want the experience for internal developers to be as smooth as for external developers. That's either external developers just developing outside without any relationship to ING, but also external developers consuming ING services. As I said, zero trust networking is an important part. And what we want to achieve or what we actually use to get this um, uh, for the resilience will be autonomous decisions. Those are very important in achieving what we want to have. Then a more technical, on a technical level, we decided to use REST over HTTP with JSON because that's very easy for everyone to inspect and debug. So that's a familiarity question. Then, for a short intermezzo, so. here's my daughter again. So who of you have kids? Well, actually quite a few, nice. So as you probably know, kids love candy, um, most of the new at least. And at least in my household, mommy is the one who decides on whether she gets candy or not. So normally I'm the one handing out the candy, but mommy actually decides whether she gets candy. So my daughter goes to mama, mommy and she asks, hey, can I have some candy or actually chocolate these days? And then if that is all fine, um, she gives a nice signed token to my daughter and then my daughter can come to me and say, hey, I want candy, give me daddy candy, uh, candy daddy. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, but did you get approval for that? So normally what you do is, yes, mommy, uh, di did your mommy say that was okay? And then yes, <laughs> or you have to show, so, is it really okay? Can she really have candy? So in our case, what we do is we say, well, okay, give me the proof of that. So my daughter gives me the, this nice scribbled note and I'm going to look at the note and see whether it's fair, it contains the signature of my wife and the date of today, so I can check whether it's still in the note for now, that it wasn't the candy of yesterday that I'm giving away. And if all of this is fine, I can get, get some candy and give it to my daughter and she's happy. Right? So this prevents us or helps actually. Now my wife can just go out of the kitchen or whatever, or go out of the room into the garden. And I don't have to shout very loud or start looking for my wife to see, is she really allowed to have candy? Because well, imagine for a daughter were to wait five seconds to get some candy, that's obviously very long. Um, so now I can give her candy right away, which is very nice. So that was the short intermezzo. So let's get back to the technical part is saying for CPU, it's very much like children. They can process a lot of information in a very short time. And looking at this graph, we can see that the um, a normal CPU actually can execute 2.4 billion uh, cycles or ticks per second and multiple instructions per tick. So if we scale that to a human time scale, we see that if, okay, one cycle, CPU cycle is one uh, second. And then we uh, see that level one cache latency, which level one cache is actually pretty fast, is still around three to four milliseconds. Uh, and then when we go to memory access, that's already uh, in the order of magnitude of 100 seconds, so already over a minute long. And then if we want to talk to something which is in San Francisco from New York, 
which is quite a quite long distance, that actually in human time scales takes over a year. So this is to indicate that we have these very fast, fa very fast processors that can execute a lot of instructions in a very short amount of time, but when they have to wait for some data to actually arrive in the processor to do the calculations, that's a huge waste of time. So, um, and in uh, normal data centers, you have around four to five millisecond latency, maybe. So that's already uh, quite a lot of, um, so the, inter the San Francisco to New York latency is about 67 or 76 milliseconds. So even the fight of the 20 uh, or 10, that's still about a month of waiting time for a human, uh, for a s processor to start keep waiting for data from another API. So let's walk through the whole process of how we develop APIs on the platform. And as I said, we have API, we, we primarily talk in terms of APIs. And first we start with having an API defined in the developer portal. And this is some API, API X, and it's version one. And then we decide to implement it because without just, with just a definition of uh, a specification, you don't get any to deliver any business value. So we implemented it with service A, also version one. And because we have learned that in order to be resilient, you need multiple instances, we just deploy multiple instances right there. Right, so nothing new so far. Now, in order to deliver the business value to our customers, we need to we decide we need to create another uh, API and another business service or service, and we call it API Y uh, implemented with Service B, and we want to consume API X in Service B. And I'm specifically saying consume API X by Service B uh, to denote that it's actually the running code that is going to consume a specific endpoint. Right, so, but how would it find this, uh, where to talk to in order to find that endpoint? Normally we don't have anything Oracle or uh, not the brand, but uh, like the Delphi Oracle. Uh, so uh, the consumer is in the, in the blue and it has to find, okay, where can I find this stuff? So normally, typically, you would introduce something called service discovery or endpoint discovery. And we call it endpoint discovery because we actually discover by endpoint. So we, uh, the, tri the triplet that I talked about before, the host method and path template, we query that into uh, end endpoint discovery and we will be, we'll be getting back a set of instances. But how is endpoint discovery going to know where those instances live? In order to, to do that, typically what you would do is to just have instances register themselves at the endpoint or service discovery. And what typically happens is that you do this through um, maybe the service name, you have some hard-coded service name in your application, and then if you consider a, bit, a security bit, what you do is you add on the, ser uh, the service discovery site, you add some access control list and you say, okay, only people or in services with this username password can uh, register instances for this service name. Um, and that's actually quite a maintainable or, or hard to maintain situation where you need to be wary that you don't pass in the wrong credentials from a run service to register another service, otherwise you will have downtime. Or um, basically you have to m keep all these credentials laying around and there is another issue, uh, namely that typically a single service will host multiple API endpoints. And now we have this kind of ephemeral knowledge about, oh yes, I know I need to consume API X, so I actually need to look for service A. And then there is this kind of, well, ephemeral in the, in the minds of the developers, this knowledge that, okay, well, sure, I should just consume service A. And when I send it a request for API X, uh, everything will be fine until it isn't. So instead what we do is we have this very big registry, which is actually the developer portal, which contains all the specifications that we have or are running within ING. And as a owner of these endpoints, you can select, okay, now I want to host these specific endpoints for in this specific service. And here you will get back from the registry or from the developer portal, you will get back the proof that you're allowed or that the or the, the, pres the presenter of this uh, thing we call the, the manifest is allowed to host these endpoints if it is actually that service. So now when the instances are registering themselves, what they will do is they will present this manifest to endpoint discovery and say, hey guys, I'm this, 
I'm, I'm allowed to host these endpoints and look, actually the service name which is included in the manifest matches the one in my certificate, which I will talk about more later. And that's actually the proof that um, th that's the way endpoint discovery knows, okay, then this instance is actually hosting these endpoints. So whenever uh, somebody c comes looking for these endpoints, I will be able to direct them there. So when a second service comes and it pro gives it manifest to service discovery, service discovery again, or endpoint discovery actually uh, knows where to send people to. So when now when somebody asks for a certain endpoint, the, or the endpoint discovery knows, okay, just send them to this. So in effect, this is nothing more than just simple DNS or normal traditional su uh, uh, service discovery as you might be used to with uh, Eureka or, or console or even uh, Zookeeper, except for the fact that now it's maintainable because it's done with the, uh, the, the decoupling of service versus endpoint and the access control lists are the authentication and authorization mechanisms are decoupled, right? So now service uh, A can register the fact that it's hosting specific endpoints with endpoint discovery. And we can actually connect service B to uh, so service A, where service B has the intention to consume API X. And of course, we do what we do here is we want to have this resilient and we'll show a bit later what kind of code we need for that. But basically, what this does is we're employing uh, client-side load balancing in, a, uh, in contrast to what you m might have is server-side load balancing. We use client-side load balancing so we can uh, more accurately determine which instances are actually healthy and not uh, which ones to ignore because they might be a bit ill. Right. Then we also want to do the security because, as I said, we have zero trust in networking, so we don't trust the network, and that means that people could be listening in on the network, and we don't want anyone to be able to detect what we're actually sending over the network. So what we employ is mutual TLS. This is a bit uh, more than normal TLS. On, in normal TLS, only the server side authenticates itself to the client, but now also the client authenticates itself to the, the service, uh, the downstream producer. And why do we do this? So we do this so we can surely know, for instance, for metrics and, and, and logging, that the other party is who says it is, and then we can just use that name because it's a trusted input. Now, what you typically have is that this, serv sorry, this service A has, want to have some means to limit the, the applications that can access them. It or can can access it because we want to say well, I'm the uh, say I'm the primary customer database and then I have this maybe uh, God mode a application that can set some kind of uh, settings for a, a person. We don't want any application to be able to set those permissions, so we want to restrict basically who's talking to us and consuming which functionality, and also we want to be able to fine tune and, and maybe. Um, have a kind of SLA between the producer and the consumer on terms of load and timeout, so we can have me, me, uh, put a bit of governance on that. So that's the other reason why mutual TLS is important. So as a consumer, what you will do is say, okay, I have this service B, and now I want to consume a specific set of endpoints. You go through the registry, and you select the endpoints you want to consume, and you register the fact that you want to consume them. And after approval, you can download something, which is the peer token and you get this receipt from the registry, which is proof, again, that uh, you are, or actually the presenter of that the service mentioned in that uh, peer token is allowed to consume the endpoints mentioned in the peer token. And that's the way, when we send it over the wire, we know that the connection is secured with, mu with mutual TLS, so on the service side we can check, okay, does the service name in the uh, client certificate match the one in the peer token? Okay, yes. If that's the case, is the, guy, is the endpoint being called the uh, actual endpoint also mentioned in the peer token? If so, yes, great. Then we we'll allow the request, otherwise we don't. And by having this, we achieve that we basically don't need any runtime component in order to uh, say yes or no to authorizations. Right. And this is shortly abbreviated, but basically this is the only part of only a bit of code you need. Uh, you include the HTTP client that we offer. Um, you tell it 
which endpoint you want to consume. So in this case, it's api.ing.com, a get, uh, get to the V1 accounts, account ID balances endpoint. And you say, well, I'm willing to wait 30 milliseconds for, the for each individual call, and then I'm willing to wait uh, 300 milliseconds for in total. Why this distinction? We, do this, uh, we have this distinction because we, we say, okay, well, we expect every individual request to take about 30 milliseconds, but I have 300 milliseconds to fulfill my part of the uh, basically backup. So I'm okay with taking 300 milliseconds to get an answer from my downstream. And within this time, retries will be happening uh, for uh, at most 300 milliseconds. And then there is this extra thing called idempotent, uh, or the method is called idempotent, but it's, it's enabling backup requests, which basically means that whenever the, uh, in this case, the of an individual request, the latency is approaching the P95 of the latency, a backup request will be issued because the idea is that the average request re or response time, the average latency is less than the 95%. So when I issue a backup request before the 95 uh, percentile uh, latency time, I, will, I can issue another one and that will come back sooner than the original request. Right. So obviously we want to expose these features to our customers and those customers are not within the ING network. So we need some way to connect to these, to these things from the World Wide Web. And we have the API gateway for that, nothing new here. So what we do is we expose these APIs. We can choose whether an API is exposed to either third party applications, uh, our various uh, websites like the, the customer portals or even public websites and the mobile devices or the mobile applications or mobile devi devices. And obviously we shouldn't be giving out balance and account details for ev about everyone to any person dropping by with a request. So we have one form of authentication and this form of authentication is going to prove that the requester is actually acting on the behalf of, of a specific customer um, which is included, the identity of which is included in this thing. And we call this the access token, but it's basically just a JWT, JSON Web Token, and it's signed and encrypted. So we are, we are very sure that whatever comes in is this, um, well, basically this, this identity for a specific customer, and we can link it to the specific application that should be using that um, token. So what we do, we, the, the application sends this token along to every request it makes to the ING APIs. And then the token is forwarded basically on every step in the chain. And why do we do this? We do this to ensure in, uh, on every step in the chain that whatever action that application is taking or the, that, that service is taking, that it's doing that in the right context of the, ri uh, the right customer. So we can use this for audit logging, uh, for um, even for tracing, but basically uh, we have this complete audit trail of which application did what, when, for which customer. So we can very easily verify when uh, a customer says, oh, well, I didn't ask for this, or yes, I did ask for it, but at a different time. So we can say, well, we actually handled or acted in behalf, on behalf of the customer. Right, so now, we actually want to know whether a specific requester is allowed to take a specific action, say, make a booking or, or transferring funds. Now, I imagine that we also have way more than just the, the feature to transfer funds. We have many more applications, many more features within the IT landscape. Um, on top of that, for each of these features, we have basically open versus closed world questions. Open world questions are like, okay, in the most general f generic form, what can I do? In a bit more closed but still open form is, okay, what can I do with this bank account? Can I send money? How much money can I transfer? Uh, or can't I? Do I, How much um, extra signatures do I need? Those are also all open questions. You also have closed questions. Those are simpler. Those, those are of the form. Um, can I do X? Can I transfer 5,000 euros from bank account one to bank account two? And that's a f usually a very simple answer to question within a single API. But questions about what can I do in general, you need to have multiple APIs involved with that, with that because there are multiple features. So because of that, this is very hard to distribute per API. We decided 
to actually have a central bit of logic or a central system, which we call the permissions API, which can be, because of its nature, can be highly scaled and distributed. So even though we say we want to prevent all kinds of systems talking to each other uh, where it's not really necessary, we say, well, in order to keep these things maintainable, we want to have them all stored in a permissions API. Because imagine that you don't only have these thousands of uh, features, but you also have 25 countries to deal with. You have 25 custom uh, governments telling you when a specific person should be on a watch list and should not be allowed access to the bank accounts anymore. You have, there are situations where basically um, a person should be uh, put under um, uh, basically observation, so only the notary can do actions on his behalf and not, uh, not that person itself anymore. And this all needs to be handled in a, a consistent and timely manner. So that's why we chose to implement it through a single system instead of having very, very big uh, tokens. Right. So um, when we uh, receive this call for every incoming call, we also uh, call the permissions API to actually check whether this is allowed or not. And I think it's a good point to mention here that we also are able to route all traffic coming in. So we're using client-side load balancing, but at any point in time, we can decide uh, through per specific per request what the actual route should be. So we can say, OK, yes, when you ever, whenever you connect to service A, you should be using a specific instance of service A. And this will be honored by both all the gateways and all the services applications, which makes testing quite easy. Then, going over a bit into the implementation, in whatever system or whatever platform you have, no matter how resilient you think it might be, what you need to have is observability in order to determine whether it's actually really resilient. So what you at the very least need is some kind of metrics to see how many errors are happening, how many failures you're seeing, the request response times, basically so that you can eyeball whether everything is still okay. But you should not be relying on these kind of metric systems because, well, you could have a big wall of graph uh, with all kinds of graphs showing whether things are okay or not. But when you're at home, you're not looking at, and at sleep, you're not looking at these graphs and these monitors. So what you actually want to have is say, well, okay, let's do away with those monitors. We have alerting. And whenever something is about to go wrong, I'll just get on the text or uh, some telegram message or whatever saying, hey, something might be going on. And then you can wake up if you want to or not, um, and start looking at these um, at the systems, you can actually look at the metrics and say, okay, yes, indeed, response times are going up, something, something is going on. In order then to troubleshoot these kind of things, what you, can ha what you want to have is a central place where you can look at logging, where you can say, okay, well, I'll just log into this logging system, and then you can see all of these things. So no, there's nothing really special about this. So we have all kinds of things like ELK, which are probably very familiar, but please, uh, use those systems so that you don't have to go SSH into all kinds of production servers and manually grab through all kinds of logs, hoping you might find something at 4 a.m. Um, so please use these kind of logging systems. And then something like tracing. So uh, there are all kinds of solutions like Zipkin or Jaeger that you can use in order to specifically see for each request. You basically can get a stack trace or a call trace over the network. You can see for which endpoint uh, on the outer edge of the API gateway, well, which instances were called, which endpoints were called, which instances that they handled those requests and then back, uh, how long those things took, and basically whether those requ responses were, or requests or responses were successful or not, whether they re were retries. And you can use these kind of tracing utilities to very specifically pinpoint any uh, production issues. Right. So some useful metrics to look at is that in general, we have learned that the available, the number of available file handles is pretty indicative of whether when things will go wrong, because if, as soon as they hit zero, your application is done. Um, look at the garbage collection pressure. So uh, look at garbage collection metrics. Those are very easy to get. Then specifically for the client that we're using, we're actually using Finagle, which we'll get in back to later. Uh, there are some, you can look at the, failure, the amount of failures that you're seeing or the client is fail, uh, seeing. Also, because all the, the client is completely asynchronous and using timers, what you want to see is uh, whether the scheduler detected blocking. So as soon as you hit the timer and you do something blocking in that, uh, in that timer call, 
then it will keep counting and as soon as the blocking milliseconds go up goes above zero something is very wrong uh, you want to look at the size of the load balancer which means the in instances of uh, or the number of uh, known instances uh, versus the ones that are busy which is finagle speak for they are the considered down and as soon as those uh, approach each other as soon as then you will uh, if actually when size is equal to bu busy you will not have any connectivity anymore also look at the amount of retries that are happening how many backups are being sent which is a specific type of retry and then in order to troubleshoot TLS latencies what's very useful to look at is whether um, how long the successful and the failing lookups took because it can still be very easy to deploy an application which might have an incorrect certificate that nobody else trusts, but it can keep connecting very quickly to everyone. And then you spend quite a lot of cycles in order to, to verify or actually um, to verify that the other one is some, somebody you don't want to talk with. Right. And there are way more metrics you should look at. So then on the implementation part of this for the one way of working. So who of you are using open source software? So I'm expecting everyone to raise their hand because you're probably using open, open uh, Java, which has been as to do, to, uh, told to no, this morning was open source. But basically whatever we do in the global API SDK is nothing new. We build on the shoulders of giants and we just mix and match it together. And this API SDK is used by all the teams developing on this platform across ING globally. And this ensures that everyone is building their application, to a certain extent at least, it ensures that everyone is building their applications in one way. We, as the maintainers of this SDK, we develop it primarily in Scala, but it serves both Java and Scala teams primarily, and uh, in fact, in general terms, everyone on the, who's running on the JVM. And it consists of two parts, namely the toolkit components, which are very small, they're modular, mix and match, and they are supposed to be very small, have the minimal set of dependencies they need, very specific for a specific task. And we also consider them an expert level. This means that you can configure them in 1,001 ways, and uh, maybe only one is correct. And because it's very hard to combine them all together in order to get a very performant and resilient API, or actually, sorry, very performant and resilient service or application, we offer you frameworks that are thin and fast moving glue layer that glue all these toolkit components together in exactly the right way, uh, providing the uh, idiomatic ways to configure it. So for example, we have a Spring Boot variant, which uses the Spring Boot properties. So you can just idiomatically to Spring Boot configure your whole application and then everything is nice. So we developed this global API SDK in an open source manner. Should say it's open source, yes, but within ING. So uh, this means that we have used, do use issues publicly within ING. Uh, we use merge requests. Everyone can look at what we're doing, can contribute to discussions. Um, and what we're intending to offer is platform compliance test kits so that whenever somebody else wants to create something, uh, they can check whether that application will be compliant or, or at least compatible with uh, the current platform as it stands. Right, so why did we choose Finagle? Finagle uh, to repeat, we use Finagle for the HTTP client and we have been doing that since 2015. And we chose it because out of the box, it ac was actually, we found that it was actually quite performant. It already had things like load balancing, retries and circuit breaking and the ability to have custom routing. And uh, recently it uh, got uh, these backup requests, which are very nice. Um, and we also found that it was quite easily to extend, easy to extend with our own metric system, with open tracing, our form of service discovery called endpoint discovery, and to just chuck in our, our own TLS validations. So I spoke about this before in more detail at uh, Scala Exchange, so you can look at the slides or the video. And my colleagues, Eggy and Effie, did a nice presentation about this in JFall last year, show, uh, actually demoing it with uh, some Raspberry Pis. Uh, so what we had to do in order to make it work within ING is we added something to the stack, which was very easy to do, is to always send the peer token uh, when it was configured. We swapped out the normal tracing filter, which is uh, native to Finagle, with a one that works with open tracing, with the open tracing API. And what we also did is we added a filter that would ensure that whenever you classify something in Finagle, because you can fin tell Finagle when a response, request response pair should be considered a success, a failure or a retriable failure, 
you can do ha have been able to tell Finagle this for quite a long time, but Finagle wouldn't retry whenever you told some uh, that the actual request response pair was a retriable failure. So in order to get actually that behavior, we added this fi uh, this filter that would ensure that whenever you as a customer of one of our customers would say this is retriable, that it would actually be retried. And then we added the debug filter, which would uh, is able to tell you when turned on, what exactly which HTTP requests and responses went over the wire to which instance and what, what the um, successes were. So, as I said, we can teach Finego about functional errors, what we as application developers consider functional errors, so we can tell it about what an HTTP status code 500 means or what a 400 means. We can also, this also means that we can tell it what a SOAP fault is, because by default, Finagle's job is done when it sent its request and gives, gives you back the response, because it's a transport layer kind of thing. But some instances might be responding or behaving badly, and we want to ignore them. But the only way to detect that they're uh, behaving badly is by inspecting the payload. So these response classifiers are very powerful, However, they are uh, defined, you define them by using partial functions, Scala partial functions, and these are not really nice to define in Java. So what we also had to do, because we serve a lot of Java customers, we added some ways to, in a Java-friendly way, def define these response classifiers. So this is one of the things you need to deal with if you're a um, basically globally, globally, op globally operating team that's providing services to all kinds of people and developing all kinds of languages, sometimes you need to be able uh, need to create bridges so it's easy to use. So what we did here is to just create an uh, trait, which is Scala speak for interface for in short, um, or abstract class, whatever you want. And we allow you to define a define method which says, okay, in this case, uh, this classifier is saying something about the request and response pair. And yes, it is a, a failure or no, this classifier doesn't have any opinion about this request and response uh, pair and that the default should be used. We have two different ways. You can either implement the class or uh, use the more functional approach by using uh, method chaining. Right, so now the endpoint discovery integration, this will show another obstacle that we had to get over. So Finagle uses resolvers to find instances, but these are loaded use with when, uh, by using Java service loading. And this, uh, a resolver like this, what it does, it, it just translates a query, a string usually, into a stream of addresses. And, um, and these addresses can either be pending, negative, field, or bound. And when it's bound, it will give you back a set of, uh, the actual set of instances that you're looking for. Um, and typically your use case would be call the HP client new service with the name of the resolver and then a bang and the query you want to send it. But as Finagle's resolvers are loaded at service loading time, and in Spring Boot you use Spring, which means beans, those beans are definitely not loaded at service loading time. We needed to have some resolver already registered with Finagle through service loading, and then have the ability to, whenever the application, the Spring Boot application in this case, would start up and configure the service discovery integration, that it would be able to plug in an actual resolver that would be actually be doing the calls. So what the deferring resolver does is, oh, there's a nice note on the screen. What the deferring resolver does is actually buffering the queries, and then whenever the actual resolver is uh, installed, basically switches all streams to the new resolver, and then all, the whole service discovery is initialized. I mentioned also that there was the possibility to explicitly route all these requests. And this is a very powerful mechanism. And with great power comes, of course, great responsibility. If you want to look at the provenance of this quote, there's an interesting link. Um, it goes back way further than you think. Uh, so uh, there is a specific form that you need to write, uh, like rewrite rules, basically, or delegation tables, that says, OK, reroute any, any call of api.ing.com a post to payments, reroute that to uh, a specific host, my malicious host, on port 1337. Of course, we don't want this because this would allow somebody anywhere in the chain to direct all kinds of payment calls or whatever calls to their own malicious hosts. So even though if we ha this would be mitigated by um, having mutual TLS and peer tokens in place, 
uh, the actual call would not uh, would not succeed, but it would take up resources, so it would be an angle of attack. So what we actually want to do is to make sure that only routes are uh, specified that include that point to specific instances that are already known to implement uh, that endpoint that you're actually calling, and we do this by explicitly mentioning the endpoint again in the rewrite rule. So there's a kind of a technical detail, but basically just saying if you use Finagle and you use DTAPs, you should be careful about which DTAP rules you allow uh, to be provided. Then in the developer portal or the registry that I already mentioned a few times before is what we do in order to ensure backwards compatibility and therefore maintenance, maintainability of the platform is we check whenever a new schema is added or actually while it's being edited whether it will be compatible with a previous version that you already have made public and if, it's, if it is, it's fine, but if it isn't well, there will be a warning given and said, okay, you can only upload this on a new major version, which means it's backwards incompatible. Uh, it also checks and ensures that all endpoints across all the um, uh, specifications are unique and that the definitions of these endpoints use definitions from our bounded context of the domain-driven design model. Um, so then going into a few of the lessons learned, uh, we have really learned that we should educate all our teams to, uh, to tell them what they're doing, basically, or actually not necessarily what they're doing, but what the code under the hood is doing, so they should be aware of what it's doing, uh, and they should, well, respect it, but also know, know and, and, and be able to explain what things should go wrong or where things sh shouldn't go wrong, but they shouldn't be hindered by it, so they shouldn't, shouldn't feel that, that the details, the decisions that we make are in their way of developing business value. So using this open source model that I mentioned before for us has been very valuable because we're getting lots of feedback and uh, very happy contributors as well. And actually it makes us proud of developing this product, which in turn uh, creates this kind of snowball effect. Uh, something you really shouldn't forget, whatever client you're using is to set those timeouts. So some clients will have infinite def timeouts by default or very short timeouts by default, but if you don't set timeouts, you basically will, be, whether you're doing synchronous calls or asynchronous calls, you will be setting up yourself for, for failure because these retries maybe will be happening continuously in the background. Nobody will even care anymore about the, the result of those retries, but these things will be continuing in the background. You will be getting either memory out, out of memory exceptions or maybe sockets that, that are, um, uh, well, spent. So please, take a look at setting your timeouts, whatever client you're using. Also, mentioned the response, uh, the response classifiers that allow you to uh, mark specific instances down because of functional failures. Beware that if you have a very small set or maybe even one single customer that might have um, a corrupt record in a database, therefore APIs will be uh, giving back 500 errors. If you would consider a 500 error to be a functional failure, then you would be, and that for that account, you would get a lot of requests, then uh, you could say, okay, well, then apparently all these instances are failing. We ignore all those instances, and basically you have denial of service to all your other customers. So beware. Then when you're using client-side load balancing to get all of these extra insights in into which uh, instance is healthy or not, please be aware of using load balancers because if you use a level four load ba balancer on a TCP level, you can create hotspots on your backends, and also you reduce visibility and actual actual actionability and um, uh, ability of your clients to do the right thing and to determine whether they should do a retry or not. And you get all kinds of other things, aside from the fact that you introduce an extra component which can fail, which you de definitely don't want. If you use level seven load balancing to mitigate. Uh, the hotspot, the uh, TCP connection hotspot issues, then you will have to terminate the TLS at the load balancer, which means that not only you added an extra component, which might fail, but you also added an extra place where data can be uh, captured. Stick to REST. REST says a uh, GET should be retriable. Please keep yourself to that. Also, keep everyone up to date with the latest versions of your software because you might be introducing all kinds of fixes. So please keep everyone up to date. Then, because of all this mutual TLS, uh, we have all kinds of certificates everywhere. They have to follow a specific format. 
uh, it becomes harder for you because we also use mutual TLS, which means all your clients should have a uh, client, uh, sorry, a certificate. So that means that you now in your browser when you want, or Postman or Curl, you also need a client certificate. So this all thing makes it quite a bit harder. So we now provide a Docker Compose uh, well, a feature so you can easily pull up a complete environment running locally on your machine, uh, including all certificates correctly set up. Then some additional measures you ta should take. This is kind of the obligatory disclaimer. All of this, what I mentioned before, is not enough, of course. You also need to do static secure code analysis. You need to have OWASP checks. Scan your Docker containers. Please don't run any arbitrary red Docker image from the uh, public hub because you're basically giving someone access to root on your machine. Well, shouldn't say why that's bad. Um, do live vulnerability scanning, like maybe uh, scanning on vulnerabilities in your production code, but do penetration testing, patching, etc. Some future work, we're going to store the SLA in the peer token so we can use it to more automatically determine which timeouts should be set and which we try to, to do or not to do. We're investigating uh, to set these kind of things like timeouts, etc., more dynamically using finagle tunables. And actually we chose REST HTTP JSON for everything, and now we need to see, okay, which are the points where we really need that, or can we introduce a more binary protocol, maybe using gRPC or flat buffers, and or flat buffers. So to conclude, in order to get a resilient platform, we use manifest and peer tokens, and we use Finagle to do the other nice load balancing, etc. for us. We use service discovery, so we can dy dynamically create instances and have them registered on the fly. We have independent or more or less independent services because all the data is basically provided to, to them to make the decision in the request aside from very dynamic um, or runtime uh, things in the permissions API. For maintainability, we have one API SDK that everyone can use and we check for backwards compatibility of uh, API specifications. We offer platform compliance or compatibility test kits. We offer ways to develop things locally and we actually consume per endpoint uh, we, uh, instead of per service, and then there has to be this ephemeral which is pro knowledge which is probably wrong about which endpoint service is implementing which endpoint. Then for security, we use the mutual TLS based on zero trust networking. We use signed tokens for all of these kind of things, so we're really sure that whatever is presented is accurate. And this way we get a resilient, maintainable, and secure platform. Right, key, sma key messages. So the success of something in general, but in fact also an API platform, starts with its architecture, its design, but really depends on the implementation. Make your platform easy to use, this holds for any software. Uh, so make it easy to use so your customer, customers will like it. This holds for whether the product is mandatory or not. Uh, keep your teams educated so they know what they're doing and you know what they are doing. Uh, Please, even though you might have all, have all these kind of mitigations like load balancing, etc., observability is key. So st still, you should be knowing what's going on in your landscape with your application so you can act upon it and even prevent things. And actually, looking back, Finagle gave us this thing called a service mesh before it was actually already a thing. So that was nice. So to conclude, security and resilience go together like horse and carriage. And th thank you for listening. And yes, we're hiring. Thank you. So I believe there is time for questions, so you can shout out and we'll repeat them. Yeah, over there. So the question is, we chose REST and HTTP, and the question is, are all applications only com communicating over HTTP? So yes, all services are communicating, or most of them are communicating over HTTP, over HTTPS, uh, of course, TLS. Uh, but of course, there are things like Cassandra and, and JDBC calls that are still in there because we do need to go to a database at some point. So how do you right, so the question is, how do we then get the same level of discoverability for these other kind of services? And at this point, uh, so things like Kafka and Cassandra have their own um, um, discovery mechanism through gossip and such. 
So you jo an application joins a cluster and the only thing you need there is basically a DNS entry to go to a certain cluster. And there, indeed, the information about which, say, table is still present in the minds of the developers and the architects and that they shouldn't connect to cluster X. That's still there. But the ideas are to make uh, this, uh, this, basically, this platform also work for those kind of things whenever they become valuable for us. Yes. Is that a question back in the back? No. Okay. No. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, you have some detection for blocking, and you also educate users. I'm wondering how challenging that is using a async framework like Finagle. Uh, do your application developers use your technology, and do they block? And how do you deal with that? Right. So the question is, uh, we provide this, paraphrasing, but we uh, provide this nice asynchronous library and then you have users and how do you educate the users to use it in an asynchronous manner instead of blocking. Um, and this is just a, ma a, f a matter of continuously talking. Having the right examples in your documentation helps because we found out that people would just copy the examples and then even leave comments in. Um, so make sure your document, I should have added that, make sure that your documentation is spot on uh, or actually should not compile in that sense, and then they need to fix it properly. And in code reviews, just keep keep telling them, uh, keep telling, saying, hey, and, and not in a pedantic way, way, but just say, hey, I noticed that you're using a blocking call here. Are you aware of the effects? Are you aware that you can, uh, by writing your code such and such, you would get it asynchronous all the way? Um, and then showing them what it basically sit down with them and show, okay, if we change these few lines, because typically it's just a few lines, um, now everything is asynchronous and look, hey, you're here, your benchmarks go or, or whatever. Uh, so basically really show the value and have your documentation already spot on to start with. All right, I think time's up. Um, still around to today and tomorrow, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, thank you again and uh, see you around.